the recording. There it is. There's the recording icon. Otherwise, Mark, are you good to go? Mark, okay. there you go. Okay, Mark, uh, why don't I just hand things over to you and uh, we'll take it from there. Um, thank you very much for coming and thank you for coming to PANSIG. Um, we always um, say um, this would not be possible without. Um, this year there are two people who really this would not be possible without. Um, this year um, PANSIG was, um, has had a challenging year um, and there was a point at which we had to go from a physical, we were planning to have a conference in Niigata and we went on to a physical conference and um, thanks to um, Joe Tomei, um, he kept the conference going as an online conference and I think without him um, none of us will be here. Uh, the other person, a lot, a lot of people have helped. Um, I'm afraid I don't have time to, to thank all the people who've helped. But the other person who, without whom we really wouldn't be here is, um, is our next speaker, um, who has put together the platform that we're working on this conference on. Um, I first met Gary, I think it was in Matsumoto when uh, Jolt Call and the ER Summit did an event together. And they had this fantastic system that would tell you on your phone what presentations were happening at the time. And I was used to conferences where you have these handbooks and you spend ages like reading through the handbook, trying to find where you are and what presentation, and you find something that's really, oh, this is really good. Oh, it finished 25 minutes ago. Um, so this great software that would tell you where you are, where you are now. So I'm gonna hand over to Gary, um, who is gonna tell us about technology, bringing us together in a chaotic world. Gary, um, thank yeah. Thank you, Mark, uh, for the kind words. Um, uh, th this is probably the first time I've made a speech since my wedding day, and I was uh, woefully underprepared that day, but I think I got away with it. Um, and in the same way that the word pan means meaning everything, of course, um, is in pan seg, which is bringing us together, and in pandemic, which is kind of pulling us apart. I like to think of technology um, in much the same way. Um, but before I really start, I'd like to say how honoured I am to be here, uh, especially I want to uh, take, uh, say that this take on this hugely complex topic really just represents a sliver of the possible solutions. Um, and it really represents a very particular viewpoint uh, based on a working lifetime with such technologies as a program and designer. Um, and although my talk will not be particularly technical, I do think it's important to understand these technologies and how they affect us. This is the PANSIG conference, and I'm thinking of the gender awareness SIG, the global issues SIG, the intercultural communication SIG, the mind brain SIG, the MAVA, uh, the MAVA SIG, mixed augmented and virtual reality SIG, just to name a few that really probably have thought deeply about these issues um, far beyond um, my own thoughts. And it's actually really daunting for me to be following the amazing Amanda Gillis Fudotaka, who's made a great talk earlier today. Um, I'm actually hoping that at the end of this talk, perhaps we can throw it open for a deeper discussion rather than me taking questions because all the SIGs are here. I think that might be a good approach. Um, so before I start, um, I would, um, I'd like to start off with a, with a personal story. Um, the web is about stories, uh, humanity is about stories. And about 10 years ago, um, I visited my grandmother. Uh, she was in her late 80s. Uh, she was very frail, uh, but she had, a, she had a very sharp mind, um, except she insisted on calling me David, um, which is my father's name, um, her son, of course. I, I was very close to my grandmother. Um, she'd actually raised me for a few years uh, when I was going to school in, in Ireland. And um, I kind of knew this was the last time um, that I'd see her. Um, and um, in her room, she had this pile of amazing photo albums. Um, um, for those of you who um, weren't raised in the era that, era that we know is before the World Wide Web and have no idea what I'm talking about, back in those dark ages, we actually used to print out photos and stick them in these books and pass them around and look at them. Um, this is my baby album from, wasn't I a cute baby, um, back from 1968 or something. Um, and my grandmother's books weren't just little books. They were big solid books, um, black paper, um, beautiful handwriting 
um, in white ink, and maybe there were about 10 of them. And I, I pulled out um, what looked like um, the oldest book. Um, and the, the first picture in it was this uh, rather cute baby. And I remember saying to my grandmother, oh, grandma, you were, you were a really cute baby. And she said, uh, she said to me, um, David, I was a cute baby, but that's not me. I went, oh, wow, this is gr uh, your, your mother, um, gr uh, Granny Riley, we used to call her. And she said, no, 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 that's not my mother. That's my grandmother. Yeah, these, these were pictures. Wow. These were pictures taken in the late 1880s, the Victorian age. And the baby was my great, great grandmother. And the woman holding her was my great, great, great grandmother. Now, you, when you see a photo like that, you can't really help but reach out and touch that picture because it's a, it's a physical object and you, you're, you're, you're touching something um, that reaches across three, three, dec three centuries of, um, of, of huge technological change. And I mean, how amazing photography must have seemed back then in the 1880s. Um, but there's a little bit more to this story. Um, when I was going through the albums, I came across um, this picture. Um, and on the right in this picture is my, is my grandmother. Um, and on the left is my grandfather. Um, and I have this picture because uh, I took a picture of the picture with my mobile phone. Now, this was not exactly a time to be playing with my phone, but I wanted one photo to bring back to me to Japan. And this was about 10 years ago. Um, and my grandmother said to me, oh, this is outside Buckingham Palace during the war. Um, granddad had just been awarded the military cross, I believe, which is not very usual for an Irishman in those days. Um, and we, 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 we chatted a little bit more and, uh, you know, she became tired. My, my, my dad returned um, and um, I, I ended up, of course, coming back to Japan. Um, now, when I switched from this old, uh, in Japan, we call it galapakeitai, I think, um, the old style foldable phone. Um, and um, <laughs> this, 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 uh, this picture kind of got lost and um, I came across it again. And I, I, I kind of became curious to know uh, whether my grandmother's memory had been correct that day. Um, she, all she said was, um, this picture was taken outside Buckingham Palace. Um, and um, all I have is this distinct, distinct wall in the background. Um, and um, so what do you do in these situations? Of course, I thought, I'll see if I can track down this picture. So the first thing I do, of course, is, is you go to Google Street View. And this is Google Street View of Buckingham Palace. Um, and um, I walked, I looked around everywhere, but finally I noticed, I can see exactly where this photo was taken. Um, if you look at the Victoria Monument in front, there's a wall there and there's another little low wall in front of it. And I was able to spot exactly where this photo was taken. Wow. Um, and I, um, I showed this to, um, to, my, to my brother and um, my brother Marcus, who is here in the audience. Um, and here today we are being connected, you know, 10,000 kilometers away. Marcus lives in London, I live in Japan. And I said to Marcus, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if you, go, you, if you, went, if you went to that same place and, and took a picture? And uh, Marcus obligingly went a few days ago and through the power of the interwebs, he sent me this photo. And this photo was taken <laughs> just three days ago. Um, the uh, the uh, rather handsome man on the left, of course, is Marcus and he is with his wife, uh, Johanna, who's from uh, Johanna, who is from uh, Sweden. And she's wearing the brooch that my grandmother gave to her. Oh, wow. And typically, um, it was raining that day. Uh, Marcus said it was absolutely tipping it down. And um, of course, in the midst of a pandemic, people uh, in the, filled up in the tube and stuff. So, um, but I look back at this, the original picture and I noticed it was always already re also raining that day too. So there's a kind of nice symmetry about this. Um, so, what, 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 why am I even telling this story? Um, mm. I think it's a story that um, 
it really it spans three great technological areas the eras the industrial age the 20th century um which of course we know was a great a, a great social change a time of war and peace um and everything in between and the information age which we're in today and how using technology in the of the web, I was able to connect more deeply to a photo taken in 1943 when my grandma was 19 years old. And the world was in a far bigger crisis then than it is now. Okay, all we have to do is sit at home, okay, um, as the joke goes. Now, my great great grandmother could never have imagined as she stuck in that photo um, back in uh, 1880 that it would end up in a presentation in Japan being streamed to hundreds of people across the globe in a time of crisis. And I mean, if she did manage to come back by time machine, I'd say, yeah, it's even on YouTube. Just don't read the comments. So this story is, 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 is also important because it showcases two types of technology and those technologies are analog and digital. Analog being a physical manifestation of data like ink on paper, magnetic charge on a cassette tape and digital information being stored as a series of ones and zeros. And of course, to actually experience digital, it has to be at the last step converted to analog. We don't experience digital. We live in an analog world. Try to look at 100 billion ones and zeros because literally that's what a 10 megabyte photo is. Uh, analog and digital are not necessarily different in the way we experience them, merely the way they're stored and transmitted. Um, by taking a, bit, a digital picture, I'm able to transmit it so much more easily. And of course, nowadays that final transmission mechanism is not usually a piece of paper. It's a little screen which we have in our pocket the whole time and we've become a little bit unhealthily obsessed with. Um, and one of the things, one of the things that I, one of the things that I often hear as a so-called technologist is that um, designers uh, of computer systems in their ivory towers, uh, we don't think about cultural issues, you just think about your machines. Um, well bear in mind while I talk about some of the problems that we do obsess about, um, now, of course, what makes uh, digital digital is that it's something represented by ones and zeros. It's binary. Um, it's a choice of two things. It's a bit like uh, 20 questions. It's a series of binary questions. It's kind of a digital pathway to an answer. Uh, but now consider this example of um, the story of Jean-Paul, uh, sorry, Jean-Dominique Bovy. Um, now, excuse my French accent. Jean-Dominique Bovy suffered from a, from a stroke and um, when he came to, he had what is known as locked in syndrome. Uh, you're fully aware of your surroundings, but you cannot communicate at all or barely at all. His, his one form of communication was his left eyelid where a blink basically meant yes and no blink meant no. And in such situations, a doctor will ask, are you awake? Um, and um, Bobby's response with the blink of his eye He's not just saying yes. He's saying, I'm Bobby, I'm human, and I have consciousness. This is the essence of his humanity has been reduced to a binary blink. And in fact, through this binary co uh, communication of going through letters of the alphabet, Bobby was able to write a memoir. It took 200,000 blinks, and each word took about two minutes. Next time you're getting in an argument on the internet, you want to respond immediately with your own iPhone, maybe slow down like Bobby did. Um, so, um, and this is what he wrote. This is part of what he wrote. Far from such din when blessed silence return, I can listen to the butterflies that flutter inside my head. To hear them, one must be calm and pay close attention for their wind beats are barely audible. Loud breathing is enough to drown them out. This is astonishing, my hearing does not approve, yet I hear them better and better. I must have butterfly hearing. So his uh, 200,000 blinks basically ends up in this, a analog manifestation of his digital output. Um, and it, interestingly, the early pioneers, um, the early pioneers, oh, the name of the book is The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Um, and um, there is a movie, which I do suggest you watch. Um, so, we don't really experience digital. Digital is just a storage mechanism. Ultimately, we live in an analog world. Um, and interestingly, um, the early pioneers of digital computers wrestled with this exact same problem as Bobby did. How do we store information with limited bits? Um, 
early storage systems could only transmit things in seven bits. We only had 128, two times two times two times two up to um, is 128 possibilities. And if you reduce everything down to 120 possibilities, this is what you get. And I think you're probably spotting the problem here, especially if you live in Japan. Um, we can't have any kanji. We don't have any of the languages that um, span uh, human expression. Um, and you might think, well, this was a nefarious plan by the, by the evil early engineers to, um, to put a Eurocentric um, uh, take on technology. N not a bit of it. Simply, they didn't have the, the data um, to store this information. And this is something we need to remember, that technology is often uh, hampered by, um, by its constraints. Um, but as time went on, um, things improved a little bit. Oh, I keep on going the wrong way. Um, now we have Unicode uh, with its 4 billion possibilities of which we use 150,000 or so. Um, and, um, and of course, if, uh, of those of us who live in J Japan, we know a few thousand of those are devoted to, to kanji. Other ones are devoted to emoji. Some of them are devoted to things like very obscure things, Kitan small script. I don't even know what it is. You might think, oh, well, problem solved. We have now have four billion. We just have to make a symbol for everything. But actually, this is not problem solved. What do we do about skin color? And this is something that the early, um, the early inventors of, the, of Unicode, how we type into our iPhones and our computer devices, had to think about these issues. Um, they are not just wrestling with, um, with technical problems. They are wrestling with problems that go to the heart of human identity. And they're trying to find complex technical solutions to very complex social issues. Um, and in the case of um, Unicode, um, they, that they added modifiers, a way to uh, change the color to better match your identity. Um, and uh, they, they also had other things like they joined symbols together so you can have mixed families. Um, and um, so the, these are things often, often the solutions that we look for aren't easy to find and often the things that are challenges for people in technology are really, really difficult to solve. And I mean, perhaps this is just me having a long wind of saying, of saying the problems that we have in the world aren't simply down to technologies, but technologies can be exploited for unethical purposes. Um, but before, before I do that, I'd like to look at how these technologies are um, affecting us on a, on a personal level. Um, the first um, the first thing is that as, as, as we remember that um, um, Bobby's thoughts are actually an abstraction, sorry, Bobby's blinks are an abstraction of his thoughts. It's a bit like a Mercator map. Uh, it skews our view of the world. Um, it's never an exact representation of the world as it is. And this especially applies to the written world. When we abstract something, something is lost. But this is interesting because we've always used words. Why are we seeing this chaos of division today? What has changed? Um, and of course, the big first change is ease and speed. Um, everything is so much easier today. Um, although, as I said before, the end product of digital is still analog. Uh, the ability, um, the, um, the ability to cope and thus transmit things, so, sorry, the ability to copy and transmit things is so much easier and faster and this changes everything. Um, if we consider the picture of my grandmother, we know, we know the story, take a picture, go to the camera shop, get it processed, wait a week, perhaps make one or two copies for friends. In the 75 years of existence of that photo, there were perhaps three copies in existence. It's just been transmitted to 200 people in a few minutes. Um, and 75 more type people than it's ever had in the 75 previous years in just a few minutes. And this has a really big effect on how we communicate online. Um, and I think um, this, um, this cartoon from one of my favorite cartoons, XCCD sums it up. Are you coming to bed? I can't, this is important. What? Someone is wrong on the internet. And I have to respond it, to it. Now, my, my, my hobby is cycling. And for some reason, um, 
Uh, it's a reason I can't really f fathom. Uh, cyclists are roundly abused online. Um, I ride, I ride a motorbike too, but it's cyclists who get all the grief. My brother actually is a vi cycling vegan, so I have no idea how he <laughs> manages. Uh, now, I'm I am acutely aware of the political background that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, but if you have this vitriolic discourse when we're talking about bicycles and veganism, uh, both universally regarded as pretty environmentally friendly pursuits, then you can be fairly certain that the person who is voicing the insults is hardly going to be swayed by rational reasoning. And this vitriol can be even more acute and unhinged when it comes to politics, race and gender. Um, so when I see, um, for example, a Facebook, um, a Facebook friend's page descend into argument and three days later go back to find the same argument still raging and no resolution and positions even more entrenched I'm thinking this is not a productive use of anyone's time and it certainly isn't good for your mental state. Do we really want carved on our gravestone? I spend a lot of time arguing with strangers and my friends online. Um, I've seen discussions between groups of professionals I respect and admire descend into bitter acrimony. It seems because someone forgot to put a smiley face or something. The only people who seem to come out well of those kinds of discussions are the people who don't get involved. Um, and these arguments can stem from the fact that what we write, as, as I've mentioned, is an abstraction of our thoughts and in abstracting what we think, things can be lost in translation. And I literally mean lost in translation because that's what the written word is. It's a translation of our thoughts and translations are never perfect. And in fact, um, Um, researchers have identified that there is a neural pathway called mirroring. And I'm sure the brain sig will have a lot more to say in this area than I do. Um, you copy the emotional state of the other person, even if you have opposing opinions. Now, we all experience this when we laugh at a joke. Steve, please laugh. And others <laughs> laugh too. Okay. Um, but this also happens when you have opposing opinions. Um, so if the opposing person is angry, then you become angry too. And given that opposing views on sensitive topics tend to breed anger, then you have a vicious circle of rising anger. And as the famous internet adage, Golden War asserts, as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving hit Nazis and Hitler's, <laughs> sorry, Nazis or Hitler <laughs> approaches one. Um, so... This was, this problem was recognized. This is a quote, this is the first yeah. mention of the smiley face ever online. And it was uh, 1982, where somebody said, I propose wow. that the following character sequence for joke markers, smiley face, read it sideways. Because people recognize that when you speak online, i.e. you type things online, then things can get out of, people can misunderstand what you're trying to say. And- um, lost. So, but at least, does that mean we should ignore these issues? No, not at all. It, but it's probably not a productive approach if your goal is to address these issues. Furthermore, if you get caught in the trap of uh, the online troll, then they are deliberately trying to antagonize you. And as we discover mm. later, the internet is also a place where amazing groups of people can come together towards a common goal. So we used to be able to walk away from our online world. But this is no longer the case. We're literally carrying the internet in our pocket. And of course, um, I'm referring uh, to the smartphone. Um, nothing has contributed more to this always connected paradigm than this little device. It's like a Tamagotchi on steroids. Um, <laughs> but you don't have this little bird bothering what? you for attention. <laughs> now you have the whole internet trying to get hold of you. Uh, um, scientists have actually shown, brain sick again, um, that these little interactions <laughs> uh, change our brains. Um, and it all starts with a push notification. Um, I, I actually have my email going back to 1994. And in 1994, I got 87 emails. Yeah, I counted them. Um, getting email was exciting. Wow, I got an email. My email uh, actually spoke to me. You got mail. How exciting was that? 87 over one year. Um, and um, <laughs> we, 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 I think at first we were like thinking, how can we live without email? Now, of course, we're beginning to think, how can we live with it? Um, but email was just checking every five minutes. Now, our, our 
our iPhone basically taps us on the shoulder instantly. And uh, this, is, this is basically a destroyer of focus. And I'm not just talking about focus on work or a task. And for that, it's a total disaster, okay? Um, as people know, um, who work with me in Pan Singh, I just say, I am turning off Slack for the day, okay? Because these constant little notifications interrupt you. So, but I'm not really just talking about work here. I'm talking about living itself. Nothing is more, nothing is that important that your dinner with your friend, your wife, your children, your lover should be interrupted by a like on Facebook of the picture that you took yesterday of the dinner that you ate with your friend, wife, child, or lover, okay? Um, of course, we know how handy the phone is when we have that Monty Python sketch about dead parrot comes up and we want to share it. Don't we just love YouTube? And I'm, I know I'm guilty of this. I see Andrew there <laughs> nodding, okay? Or we can't remember that actress in North by Northwest who also appeared in that song by Lloyd Cole. But at least it's an active choice. It's a shared experience. Um, and we've always, we've always a sort to escape um, our daily lives through books and movies. But these escapes are an active decision. They're not an interruption. Now even our escapes have been instructed, interrupted by other escapes. Mm -hmm. And you know why it's so hard to turn off these addictive distractions? Because they are designed that way. This is what these companies are trying to do. Um, and this is, this, is, this is compounded by how we feel we need to present ourselves on the web. And this is what I like to call, I'm sure it's not an original expression, the abstract you. Um, and, you know, if it, was, if it was hard enough being a teenager when you had 30 peers judging you, now your Facebook or Instagram profile is becoming an abstract version of yourself. So not just teenagers, constantly being compared to each other, but having thousands of people looking at their profiles and feeling that they have to put their best face to the world. Okay, and this is, this is causing genuinely stress and anxiety in the younger generations. Um, so this picture, and as I say, apologies to Ronnie McGree, is not a picture of Gary on a bicycle. It's not even a picture of Gary on a bicycle. And it's not even a picture of a shadow of Gary on a bicycle. It's a representation filtered through the prism of technology that produced it. And this, this, in the same way, we're doing the same thing with our online selves. We're creating a version of ourselves that doesn't exist through our Instagram pictures, our living the life pictures that we see everywhere. There's such an obsession with creating a perfect version of yourself online that we may be skewing the real life we should be leading instead. And no one is more affected by this than the young. And this is just a quick search, a literally search for this, pulled up the first three or four things that I could find. And I typed in the following three things, social media stress and young. And this is what it throws up. Anxiety on right, on the rise among the young in social media age. A rise in depression among teens and young adults could be linked to social media use. More evidence links social media use to poorer mental health in teens. And this, this is then compounded by social, the complicitness of social media companies to exploit this. Um, and and how, how, do, how do they do this? Um, well, Every, every interaction you make on the web can and is often recorded. That Google search you made is recorded. That video you watched on YouTube, that was recorded that you watched that video. That not safe for work video that you watched somewhere else, also recorded. That like button you clicked, recorded. That Instagram photo that you liked, recorded. That tweet you retreated, recorded. And due to tracking cookies, assume that every single interaction you make links you to a single data point. And that when you log into your social media account, this data point can be tied to you as an individual. Now you might think, oh, that's not so bad. I like my, 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 my friend's post on Facebook. So what? Well, your friend's post is scanned for the type of words it contains the tone it has, and through machine learning, this has probably been collated with other posts that that same user has made, giving a political profile. Now this is used to build up a political profile of you, 
maybe your sexual orientation, your health problems, or more likely all of these things. Think of all the things you connect to. Then advertisers, political parties, or interest groups can target you with the hot button issues that you are likely to, that are likely to make you vote one way or the other, or make you buy something. Now that political advertising does not even need to be true, as we know, as we've discovered. In fact, the more scaremongering it is, the more effective it is. And if one political side has access to this data, then it's a huge political advantage. And if both sides have it, where there could be nuance before, now we have a chasm between each other. And if this sounds far-fetched, this is pretty much an exact description of the Cambridge Analytica standoff. So this has already happened. So in other words, our democracy itself has been shaped by our online interactions. And the reason this is happening is because Facebook and Twitter in the works of Mike Montero have designed it that way. The like system is working exactly as it's intended to work, a way to track you and define you. Um, take this example. Now oh, this looks pretty harmless. Which Disney princess are you? And I'm sure you've seen these all over the place on the internet. You might have even answered a few of them. Um, this is harmless, right? Well, actually, no. Um, you are more likely your daughter has just filled in a questionnaire about themselves, and the responses are then collated with all their other interactions, and a profile is built up. Combine this with your son or daughter liking a particular pop star they follow on Instagram, searches they have made on Google. You might. Uh, a teenager might be uh, searching for something, how do I lose weight or something? Um, and a company's bottom line depends on young adults spending money on trying to attain a standard of beauty that is only realistic if that's Photoshop, then you have a crisis. In fact, a company's bottom line depends on the person not attaining this goal with predictable results for the mental well-being of our young. It's in the interest of such com companies to make desire that other thing, sorry, to make young people desire that other thing they cannot attain. Um, are, our photos, are our phones listening on us, passing our conversations, are analysts pouring over our words? Probably not, but here's the thing, they don't have to. Through your likes and your retweet, you're already doing the work for them. Your friend who said, I was just talking about chainsaws and suddenly there was a chainsaw photo on my Facebook page. No, it wasn't that they were so interested in you talking about chainsaws. It was because you searched for how do I cut down a tree in my backyard? Or if I'm being particularly cynical, how do I dispose of a body? Um, so we, 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 we um, <laughs> so we, we, basically the idea is, you know, we, we have, we have to, we have to reassess. Um, we have to, we have to reassess a social company's complicitness in this, in the same way that tobacco companies fought 70 years ago to portray their product as safe and good for you, it's time that we started to look at social media in the same way. Um, and, but how, how, can we, how can we reverse this trend? Well, it's not all bad, of course. Um, while the internet has its problems, it can also bring us together in incredible ways. This a conference attests to that. Um, we're here in the middle of the pandemic yet, we're sorry, we're in the middle of the pandemic yet here we are. Um, but I'd like, to tell another, <laughs> I'd like to tell another story, uh, not a personal one this time, but this is one that I came across on the BBC. Um, and this one's titled, My Disabled Son's Amazing Life, Gaming Life in the World of Warcraft. Now, um, I'm just going to um, uh, read the exact quote from the article. It said, Robert and Trude from Denmark mourn what they thought had been a lonely and isolated life for their disabled son, but when Matt's died, they discovered that people all over Europe lit candles in his memory. So uh, Matt's uh, just suffered from um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is, it's a rare genetic disorder, um, which causes muscle degeneration and eventual muscular destruction. He only lived to be 25, which is actually quite a lot longer than most such patients. I recommend that you read the whole article. I will try to put it in the chat after the talk. Um, but during his short life, Matz was able to connect to a disparate group of people whom he had a deep and lasting connection through playing this game. Um, and he, he became a member of a group called Starlight. Now, I'm not particularly familiar with the game, but the relationships he made, they were no less deep and real than the ones we make in the physical world. Um, perhaps in his case, deeper. And his friends online didn't really think of him as Matt's. They thought of him 
uh, to quote Matt, Spitted says as Eibelin, a nobleman by birth, a philanderer and a detective. And I think this statement by Anne Hamill, 65 year old retired psychologist from Salisbury, who played this game with him, summed it up perfectly. Because we meet other without preconceptions, Starlight feels safe, even those for those who see themselves as outsiders. Online play is a fantastic arena for meeting people and building friendships. We discover each other without stereotypes. It provides the chance to find out if we like someone and only then reveal our age, gender, disability, or skin color if we feel like it. I think Matt's was lucky to belong to our time technologically. In Starlight, he was a key member. If he'd been born 15 years early, he wouldn't have had a, found a community like that. Um, and I think this is a perfect example of how communities can bring us together. Now, another example that I'd like to show, and I'm going to show this very quickly as I feel that I'm going to run out of time, um, is this is something that my, um, oh, th these are some of the, the, the other players in the game. Um, and this is an example that James York, uh, my co-chair at Jolt 2020, came up with um, a part of his research. Um, and basically he uses uh, Reddit um, in the, in, as, as a way to help students engage online and uh, get a chance um, to speak English. Um, and I mean, I don't know how much of you know about Reddit, but Reddit is absolutely massive. There's practically a, a subreddit, which is one of the groups for pretty much anything. Um, this, is a, this is a subreddit that uh, James, a student used for um, making Gundam plastic models. 108,000 people are part of this group. Um, and um, James's student posted this post um, and um, he basically said afterwards, after getting a th almost a thousand likes and dozens and dozens of comments, he's basically said, he basically said, I had no idea that so many people could be interested in this thing that I'm interested in. And I'm not talking about tribes here. Um, just because I like cats doesn't mean I have to dislike dogs. I just like cats. Um, so rather than throwing ourselves out to the world randomly, the internet is a place where we can find a sense of belonging and sharing, just as Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, envisaged it to be. Um, and when I was, um, when I was, I was uh, writing this, um, this talk, um, and I was trying to think of the way that the web does bring us together in amazing ways, the things that I love about it. Um, I love that I can plan a motorcycle ride with my buddy Steve Hennebury using Google Maps. Um, mm. And here we are in the Japan <laughs> Sea. I love that while we're there and we cannot, we have nowhere to stay, I can find a place to stay and end up in the local beer factory, as the sign said. I love that I can meet local cyclists via an app and be encouraged as I slog mm. up the slope of death. And I bump into my local cyclists, Japanese people I pass on to on the road and we share stories um, about cycling, why we're into cycling, how it's made us feel more healthy. I love that I can get YouTube hints on how to do practically anything, including this talk. I'm not sure how well I've done here. I can ask other programmers technical questions about learning something new that GitHub exists. I couldn't do my job without it. I love that I can use the internet to build something on the internet. Um, Wikipedia, enough said about the Wikipedia. I love that I can drink wine with Carolina and Raluca who are in the audience, even though they're 10,000 kilometers away and in different cultures. I love that my research assistant can tell me where I'm going wrong. And I love that people can be mobilized to create positive social change. Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. Uh, that a teenager can mobilize a generation to care about our environment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is my end on the topic. I think we need to learn to harness the power of the internet to make co connections we are in control of. It should be augmenting our reality, not defining it. And I'd like to th uh, thank you all. Um, and um, I, would, if, I don't know if people have got questions directly from me, but I would like it if perhaps we could use this as a sort of springboard for discussion, uh, because I know there are so many brilliant people in this audience. Thank you for listening. Before we go to questions, I would like to offer everyone a chance to unmute their mics and get ready to give Gary a good round of applause. Awesome. Very, very persuasive on both sides. Woo.
Wonderful work. Wonderful work, Gary. Um, if I should stop questions. sharing. I need to stop sharing, don't I? That might work, yeah. yeah. Um, if you are interested in asking Gary a question, I would suggest that uh, you turn on your camera and maybe turn on your mic. Yeah. And there are still a fair number of people in the audience. So uh, at this point, if you know where your raise yeah, hand button yeah. is in the participants list, I would appreciate if you use that or raise your hand physically in your camera to ask a question. Otherwise, if you're feeling brave, you can also turn on your mic, but um, uh, we'll probably have to step in, step in if things get a bit chaotic. So who would like to go first? If you just wanna open your mic or raise your hand. There is a question in the chat. There is a question. In, oh, you just got there. Okay, Gary, uh, what do you think is the difference between the CEO responses from Facebook and Twitter on fact-checking false reports? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> easy one to start with. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, we, we're going to the heart of free speech here, aren't we? Um, and um, well, I think the fact this is this is something that I've, I taught I, I touched on um, touched on before, but essentially, um, Twitter. I'm going to talk about Twitter mainly. Um, uh, twi twi Twitter works in the way that it was designed to work, um, and I mean the fact of the matter is we have incredible ways of using machine learning to define people's characters, people's characteristics. Yet Twitter is a place where invariably women have been subjected to enormous amounts of abuse and are leaving the system in droves. And yet there is a difference between, there is this fundamental difference between voicing your opinion and, and abuse. And I do not think, I think Twitter, ha what, the road that Twitter has, got, has gone down is that because they have decided that we are going to allow a certain person to break our rules in the interest of, I don't know, the record, I suppose, um, they've kind of got themselves into a bind where they don't know now what to do. Um, and I, my feeling is that, um, essentially we need to find a way i think the first thing we need to address is the abuse issue and this is a terrible problem on twitter i think pretty much so any 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 smart woman of um who who is successful just deals with this constantly and i think this is something that twitter needs to address so i don't know if i'm really answering the question i don't even know if it's really my my something that i can i can answer but what i can say is that i feel that uh, facebook is going in somewhat the right direction um, i think we shouldn't be policing individuals about um, but once you start having political discourse being our politicians using these, these, these platforms as a way to spread untruths, and I'm not saying left or right here, I'm trying to put this in general terms, although I do have a, do, I do have a position on this. Um, I think, I think um, that Facebook is mo moving the right, in the correct way, but I think uh, Twitter has kind of dug itself into a, Put itself into a corner and they're struggling to get out of it. Uh, I have another question for you, Gary. Um, you made the back end of this site and the Jolt Call site. And that you talked is, about. Yes, that's <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm trying to be dramatic with my pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you uh, created this site, the Jolt Call site, and you talked about technology and culture. So, what did you learn from doing these two sites, and what surprised you the most? <laughs> um, well, the first thing um, is is that um, is that one of the things that you discover when you're making a site really quickly is that it is never as good as you want it to be. Um, and I'll, 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 give you a, uh, I'll give you a particular example. Um, I know that there are people out there, I know I would have probably addressed this today, but I just didn't really have enough time to put it in. That, um, I, I, it's something like 20% of men are red, green, colorblind. And I have some red, green buttons on the website. That's problematic. Um, I, but the main thing I think is that 
one, one of the things when I was doing both the Jolt Call Conference and the Pan SIG Conference is that um, I was in more contact with the presenters than I normally would be doing a back end of something like this. And I was writing emails to them saying, or having a Zoom meeting, and I, I, I'd invariably being apologetic, saying, I'm so sorry, we're so pushed for time, I can't get this feature in. And the overwhelming response was, don't worry about it. We're just glad this is happening. And I think this 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 is something that that really kind of touched me in a way. Is that, um, and I've been looking at the website today, and I see a bug in it where every 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 presentation seems to appear twice on yeah. on the live live feed, and it's been irritating me. As Steve has been telling me off about it all day, but no one else has brought it up. So um, I, th I, th I, th I think I, I think I, th <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a way that you can bring people together w through technology, and I get I guess um, that's what I've learned is that um, technology is a great way to bring people together, and especially in times like this. Um, just to run a reminder, everyone, we've got about 15 minutes left until this turns into a booze fest, but uh, <laughs> we still have time for questions. And a couple of uh, points were given out by uh, some ladies in the audience that uh, very much concurred with your point, Gary, about Twitter being uh, quite abusive. And it's something that women have to deal with at all times. And there are other questions, and I'll give you the next one, uh, from Scott. Uh, in a way, isn't opening our students up to platforms like Reddit a bit like throwing them to the sharks? There's a lot to unpack as far as not safe for work material and pragmatics. I, I'm hoping that James is in the audience, but I fear that he's um, he's um, busy today. <laughs> James had that. James was asked that um, exact question, and uh, I am I wasn't really talking about Reddit in uh, in the sense of just uh, students. I was uh, talking, giving it as an example of the way we can connect to other people. Um, but I would say no. <laughs> I, th I think, I think, of course, I mean, students are going online, whatever we do. Yeah. So um, I think, um, I think it's, I think we have to accept that there's a huge online world out there that young people are going to be pulled into. Um, but I think we do need to educate them how to use this online world and yeah. not use it, not be, not, as I say, be pulled into it in such a way that they feel that they have to impress their friends. They have to tweet Instagram pictures in a particular way to make them con conform to some ideal of something. I think by looking for communities and being guided by parents, hopefully, that will go to their strengths or the thing, those, those weird things that they're interested in. Um, I mean, the, the web is such a huge place and there are so many great communities and pretty much people who have shared experience are happy to share those experiences with other people. That doesn't mean every group is positive, as we know, but so... Um, um, the, sh the, the, the short answer to that one, and I think um, James said exactly the same thing, but please talk to James York about that. He will have many, a much better response than I do. Okay, I, I don't know what to make of this question, but it was a question, and uh, okay. Uh, do you think Darth... Whoa, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it just jumped in chat. Do you think Darth Vader's suit was Wi-Fi capable? <laughs> Bluetooth, one the, maybe. Bluetooth one maybe. Of the, one of the things I love about early Star Wars, and it just shows you what, and, and these kind of early technologies that they're right, like in, for example, um, uh, Kirk, by the way, um, that <laughs> they, they, are, um, they are able to beam each other across planets, but they still have screens which are like, uh, um, uh, like they still have these big monitors, which not flat screen monitors. It's interesting how uh, te the technology of the past is both way beyond what we have now, but um, incredibly quaint at the same time. So I actually love looking at that. Um, um, so, or, or those, those little um, those little phones that they used to have. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I would guess he had Wi-Fi, but um, of course Darth Vader just thought by mind control, right? So um, I don't think he needed it. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, would anyone like to open their mics and ask Gary a question directly? I do see that Scott has his hand raised. Oh, uh, where is Scott? 
Scott, why did you just open your mic and ask your question? Uh, sorry about that. I think you already asked my question. I had it. In oh, <laughs> there you go. Okay. No, it's hand technology. There you go. Yeah, no, the <laughs> the chat coming. windows oh. covering up. Yeah. So, gotcha. uh, although I'll, say, I'll, I'll jump in if you don't oh. mind. I mean, one thing that Gary mentioned when he was asked about, you know, what he learned from making this site is in how communities can come together. Um, just as, a, as an example, um, last night I stopped into the Nagoya Jalt um, meeting. And, you know, of course, every, every local Jalt chapter, like I'm in Hidoshima Jalt and they meet once a month. And maybe other, every other chapter meets once a month. But Nagoya met online this month and I joined from Shimane. And then you've got like the OTJ, OTJ, right? That, uh, that you've OTJ. got going on. Yeah. yeah. And we've got these communities now where this situation where we are all kind of like locked in home and suddenly in this emergency teaching situation, I think has been a great professional development opportunity for language teachers. Um, one, because we can reach out to each other and Zoom is making this happen, and people like Gary are putting sites together to make this happen, and people like Jose are making communities um, to make this happen. And we have the challenges of using these new tools, which when we were developing new skills and learning to interact with our students in, in new and better, maybe not better ways, but in new ways, in ways that all, actually yeah. speak to the children. I think also there's a secondary thing about COVID-19 is that now that we're stuck indoors, suddenly we're beginning to appreciate how important outdoors is to us. Yeah. Um, and tr we're trying, I think we're, while we are communicating online in, and we're being, we're pulling each other together in, 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 in a meeting like this, I think we're also learning that we, we need to kind of, disassociate ourselves from on, on our online world. And um, that is kind of the core of, for me, what things come down to is that we have to find a way, just stepping outside. One of the things that I did, that, that, that photo of the shadow of me, um, on Wednesday when I was uh, getting rather overwhelmed with all the Pan 6 stuff, I was like, I just got on the bicycle and went for a cycle for two hours in the evening. Um, that's why I disappeared, guys. Um, and I came back. I basically uh, done nothing except take a couple of pictures. And then I came back and I felt, oh, yes, I feel that much more refreshed. And I think this is something by stepping away from our online world and being caught in, a, in this situation, we're actually learning a little bit better that there is the online world is just something that we should not not live in, but something we should kind of used to improve our out, outdoor world or outside world. Uh, I have a comment here, uh, specifically for what you said just now, Steve. Um, devil's advocate, what Steve just said. And kudos to the huge efforts by, oh, okay, that's a compliment yeah, to Yeah, that's me. okay. <laughs> um, why have the stewards of our professional development communities, work and volunteer, not have made more <laughs> proactive <laughs> before COVID-19 with mobilizing such interactive tools. Are the tools actually just more available now or known to be available? I would say personally, I think it's, I think it's the latter. I mean, Zoom has already always been around. I'm not, this is no plug for Zoom, of course, but um, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what's the term? A necessity is the mother of invention. Now that we need these tools, of course, we're, we're, we're reaching for them and trying to, trying to find all sorts of ways in which we can communicate better. And I think we're learning new ways to do this. Um, and we're, we're, still, we're still, I mean, the, the web is 30 years old um, and yet we still seem, we still are learning how to use it. COVID-19 is about, we, we've been stuck inside for like two or three weeks or maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that, but this hit us suddenly. We weren't prepared for it. I mean, I know that my university, if my university had been told to go online, they would have spent five years planning it. Yeah. Not, not five days as well. Practically it came down to, and I yeah. think this is, this is the reality. Um, but I think that, I mean, th I think this is, this is something that goes to the heart of, of who we are as people is that we can come together in these kind of uh, 
communities and we can kind of help each other. And I know maybe, maybe if there's a silver lining of all this, maybe this will help us to learn a bit more about what we feel is important. Also, if I might abuse what it is. <laughs> um, Jenny, did you want to say something? Sorry, Jenny. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted to, to add to that of, especially here in Japan, why change if you don't have to? And even if you <laughs> have to, why change? Um, it's Box sort of the, the, the motto of yeah. this country. So it's, it's not even necessarily that they haven't been proactive in trying to promote it, but you can't get buy-in that easily. Like I know that in my workplace personally, when we, when Abe made the announcement to shut all schools down starting March 2nd, I had proposed going online then, and it took us until the end of May to do it. So. But I think it's, it's not just schools. I mean, think of, think of the global, you know, the, the, the carbon footprint this meeting is saving. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've got, as a Jolt Call had people from 60 countries. I mean, I think, I think this is, now that we've been forced to do it, we're actually often seeing the benefits of doing it this way. So I'm sure that there will be many more virtual online conferences. Maybe most conferences will go virtually online because the idea of getting on an airplane, flying to Seattle, spending two days there flying back again to make a 30 minute presentation is, yeah. well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not good for the environment. Um, the, I'd like a shout out to the Mava group, the, um, mm. I, I can't even remember what virtual reality, virtual, group. virtual tourism. Yeah. How this is going to change things. So we're, we're, we're scratching the surface here. We're all looking we're, at the moment. We're looking at a, like, I'm looking at a whole lot of little boxes, but I think we will learn how to, how to and technology will improve that this connectivity will actually be much much feel much more real than it does now and th this will take technology changes um with uh, like virtual reality which of course is a huge block on our face but you know the same way as the iphone has got sh the phone is shrunk so will these interactive technologies if i can um um, the point that I wanted to make is very much related to what Jenny said, and I'm glad she actually did say it, if I may. Um, and it's related to what Curtis Kelly uh, added to what Jenny said in the chat. Um, we now, in this situation, the one that Gary was just talking about, and um, I was in the bilingual SIG just uh, before, and they were talking about how COVID-19 had changed their roles as parents. And, and I think about my own personal experience these past... Um, three months or so, and how now, for some reason, people are talking about my name on the same, in the same sentence with Gary Ross, which, which is not something that I expected three months ago. Uh, and the opportunity that it presented itself for people who are willing to step forward and actually try to get things done outside. And when people talk about OTJ, what I see there at that, at that group is that these are a lot of people who really don't care about bureaucracy or titles or degrees, and they just want to get things done. And when Jenny says that, uh, you know, but people just don't want to change, I think what we have here in front of us is an incredible push the envelope moment. And uh, a lot is going to be shaken from the tree. Now, shaking the tree is particularly hard in Japan. But if we can maybe just try to summon up the courage that a lot of us in our cynicism and being, becoming jaded over the past 30 or 20 years have gotten used to putting away on the shelf mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. making an effort to reuse it again, this is an opportunity that presents itself maybe only once every, I don't know, 100 years, where we can say, see, I told you, Jenny, you can go up to those people and say, see, I told you, and, uh, and start telling them that we need to change. Uh -huh. There's just some things that we've been doing for, for however many decades that we've never questioned. And part of it is what Gary was talking about today. And part of it is what uh, we've all been talking about, at least for today and probably on into tomorrow, about pushing the envelope. I mean, I think this is an incredible opportunity if we take it. Hi, Marcus. <laughs> the cat oh, I, I, feel like, I feel like there's a glitch in the matrix. Is that a glitch in the matrix? The black cat crossing like nonstop? Cat zoom bomb. No conference is complete without a cat zoom bomb. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and thank you, Marcus, for, 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 for going across London in the pouring rain. That, fo that photo was um, brilliant. That photo was yeah, brilliant. I hope, yeah, you, I hope yeah. you frame that and put that up someplace, really. That's We're glad photo. that London obliged. It played its role by pouring down with rain for the first time in about three months. Just to step out the house. <laughs> and if you still have not yet... Uh, Sorry, Marcus, if you still have not yet had enough of cats okay, Zoom bombing your conference. Uh, oh, Linda changed the camera angle. That's too bad. Okay. There you go. Oh. There you go. Okay. Oh, I, I, would, I, I would bring my own cat in, but as I've told other people here, she is the no, goddess of destruction. <laughs> we live in a Japanese house and she's just destroyed everything. So I'm okay. not going to bring her in here. So uh, the party, is, I think. It is now past uh, 7.30. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to uh, drink. Uh, before we do, I would propose that we open up our mics just one more time and uh, get ready to uh, show Gary our appreciation. Gary, I want to say thank you very much. You've done a great job here. You've done a great job at Jolt Call, and this was a great keynote. Thank you very much. Hey. <laughs> I, I would personally like to thank Jose, who, who worked very hard to put the Zoom side of things together. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he has worked really hard to make the, the actual Zoom sessions go smoothly. And because really, once, once we're out of my little website, we pop into Zoom. So thank you, Jose, for doing yeah. that. But, 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 but. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> save, that, save, that, save that applause. And... <laughs> Gary. And Jenny, of course. There you go. There you go. There's the real genius. There you go. I applaud that. <laughs>